Good morning, everyone. This is Iris Caldwell from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, we're going to get started here in just a couple minutes. Good morning again. Uh, this is Iris Caldwell, and I'm joined by my colleague Antonio Gomez here at the University of Illinois Chicago in the Energy Resources Center. We facilitate the Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group, and as part of our support for that working group, we provide information and resources like today's webinar about habitat and utility and transportation rights of way and on other energy and transportation landscapes. We're very excited to return with this pollinator and practice webinar series where we're featuring on-the-ground projects on energy and transportation rights of way. Before we start, however, we have a couple of quick announcements. Coming up next month is the Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group meeting in conjunction with the Edison Electric Institute and the Electric Power Research Institute. Together, we're going to be hosting a joint workshop on pollinator habitat. We'll be in Washington, D.C. this time. And if you'd like more information about our meeting um, or to register, you can follow this short link, www.erc.uic.edu backslash register. Again, where you can find more information and to register for the meeting. Um, you can also find announcements, um, the agenda, and other um, location type information um, at the site as well. So we look forward to um, your participation. Um, you can register to attend in person or by webinar. Um, so a couple of different options to join. We also have a few logistical items um, to discuss before we get started. Um, first off, of you all are in um, listen-only mode um, due to the number of attendees we have on the webinar. So if you're experiencing any sort of technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat box. Um, and we'll respond to you as quickly as we can. We've also built in some time at the end of the presentation for questions. However, as you think of questions, go ahead and chat them into that box. Uh, we'll collect them, and then we'll go through them one by one um, at the end of the presentation as time allows. There's also a handout um, that we've provided for um, this presentation that the presenters will refer to. Uh, you can access that handout um, from your dashboard screen. If you have trouble accessing the handout, please let us know and we can email that to you separately. Okay, so now we're ready to launch into our webinar presentation for today. Uh, today we are joined by uh, five presenters from Seattle City Light, the Common Acre, and the University of Washington. And they'll be talking about the Green Line Project which is based in Seattle and has brought together a variety of community-based stewardship groups in an effort to promote pollinator habitat on their transmission right-of-way in the Duwamish Valley. 
The presenters today are David Bayard, who is a power line clearance and landscape manager for Seattle City Light. In this capacity, he's responsible for distribution power line clearance, transmission rights of way maintenance, landscape maintenance, and urban forestry program. He's joined by Rory Denaben, who's a restoration ecologist with Seattle City Light. Um, he has over 20 years of experience in ecological restoration in a range of positions from laborer to plant ecologist. Rory has become equal parts mumbling, eyes to the ground, plant geek, hardcore realist about the constraints of rights of way, and wide-eyed advocate for using science and traditional ecological knowledge to adapt vegetation management and improve habitat. We also have Bob Redmond, who's the founder of Common Acre, which is a nonprofit which cultivates restorative relationships between people and the land. Allison Rinyard, also at Common Acre, um, she has been um, an Alley Cat Acres farm manager in 2013 and was their first executive director in 2015, um, leading to her new role as executive director of the Common Acre in 2017. And then finally, we have Evan Sugden, who teaches entomology and beekeeping at the University of Washington. He's kept bees for most of his adult life, um, worldwide and in many capacities. And his interest in native bees and their potential interaction with honeybees drove his PhD dissertation thesis and continues to stimulate his research. So please join me in welcoming um, these speakers. And I'll now turn it over uh, to David. All right, thank you, Iris. Um, my name is Dave Baird I'm with Seattle City Light, and uh, I just want to first off thank uh, Iris and Antonio and the entire Right Away as Habitat Working Group for uh, hosting this webinar today, and uh, the UW and the Common Acre for uh, being here and being a part of this with us, um, both the work and the webinar. Um, my job here is just to kind of set some context uh, right off the bat so we know where we're talking about and why we're talking about where we're talking about, and then get out of the way for the interesting folks to talk. So uh, just to get going here, uh, this slide here is kind of an overview of Seattle City Light. One thing I wanted to point out real quick is that City Light, when we say we're a public power entity, the City Light is actually a department of the city of Seattle. So just like Department of Transportation or Housing or Human Services or anybody else, we're accountable to the people of Seattle and to the elected officials in Seattle. And that's just a different model than, than a lot of power companies out there. Um, and it really informs a lot of the decisions that we make and the, and the factors that go into the decisions that we make. So this focus on um, our values at the bottom of the slide, their excellence, accountability, trust, and stewardship really do have a large um, part in deciding how we try to get our business done and how we make sure that Seattle's got power. We also consider ourselves one of the nation's greenest utilities, which largely uh, derives from the fact that we've been, we were the first carbon neutral uh, public utility in the country and have remained carbon neutral uh, since attaining that stature. We're very proud of that. So with that, um, there's a tiny lag on the slide, so I apologize for that. Uh, here's me again. And here is a quick overview of the way uh, power works. So Seattle City Light is a generation, transmission, and distribution utility, which means we generate uh, the majority of our power uh, on our own up at a couple of hydroelectric facilities, uh, primarily in the northern part of the state of Washington. Um, then we transmit that uh, energy from the generation sites along the transmission rights of way, which are the, the largely wide open spaces with the big scary towers. Um, that run down to the metro Seattle area. And then at that point, the power goes into a substation, which are located in the neighborhoods around Seattle. The power gets stepped down in voltage again, and then runs along the poles uh, through the neighborhoods until it hits the, the transformers on the poles, which are the little garbage can looking things up at the top that again, step the power down and bring it into a voltage that your uh, house can use that won't blow up your toaster. Uh, today, what we're going to be talking about is the transmission right-of-way. Uh, Seattle City Light has about 565 circuit miles of transmission right-of-way. About 500 of that is at the 230 kilovolt um, level, and that becomes important uh, in a minute. The rest of it is uh, 115 kV uh, sub-transmission. But what we're focusing on today is that, that 230 kV system. 
And the reason for that is that back uh, before 2003, vegetation management, so the management of the vegetation that is on those transmission rights of way, uh, was largely not regulated by the federal government or any specific entity. Uh, each utility kind of had their own approach for how they were going to handle these things. And then in 2003, uh, we had a blackout. And it was a pretty, pretty significant one in the northeast of the United States, southeast of Canada. About 50 million people uh, lost power in what was, what was considered a cascading outage. Uh, when the autopsy was done on the outage, it was determined that basically what happened is a tree grew up from within that managed right of way and made contact with the power lines, which caused an outage. And then that outage, um, because of a failure of an alarm system, um, caused another outage, which caused another outage, which caused another outage. And then you have this cascading outages where 50 million people are out of power. Um, the federal government at that point said, well, that's a problem. Let's not do that again. And so the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission which is the federal agency that's responsible for these things, created the North American Electrical Reliability Corporation and tasked it with regulating a whole host of issues around um, power transmission. But for our purposes, specifically uh, created what's known as FA FAC3, which is the standard that deals directly with transmission vegetation management. And basically what uh, NERC says, again, that's the North American Electrical Reliability Corporation said was, we're not going to tell you how to do your job specifically because conditions vary all over the country and all over uh, Mexico and, and Canada as well, but we're going to tell you don't ever let that happen again. So the three big things are make sure that under no circumstances any tree or vegetation grows from within that managed right of way and makes contact with your power lines. Second most important thing is make sure that no tree um, that grows within that managed right of way has the ability to fall if it were to fail into the power lines and cause an outage. And then the third step is, is to make sure that the areas that are on the outside of your rights of way, so beyond where you're managing, make sure those trees, at least you know what's going on and you're managing the risk as much as possible to prevent them from falling into the right of way, uh, which, is a, which is a particularly unique challenge in the Pacific Northwest where our trees want to grow a couple hundred feet tall in their adolescence. So that makes life exciting for us. When uh, this map here on the left-hand side is our transmission system that is um, NERC compliant, so the part of the system that 500 miles, that's 230 kV um, that NERC oversees. The reason NERC draws a line, actually they draw the line at 200 kV, everything from 200 kV up is considered part of the bulk electric system, the bulk electric grid. So that's all connected throughout the United States um, and portions of Canada and Mexico. And that's where they're saying, okay, we want to make sure that we won't ever have this cascading situation again. We do have about 100 miles of, of sub-transmission, like I mentioned before, but that's not tied into the whole grid in quite the same way. So it's kind of out of NERC's purview. Um, again, when NERC was set up and set up FAC 003, they said, well, again, we're not going to tell you how to do your job, but we are going to tell you that if you don't do your job, we can fine you up to a million dollars a day per incident for the duration of the incident until it is mitigated. So that doesn't mean until the wires are back up and the power is back on. That means a million dollars a day until you fix whatever vegetation problem caused the problem to begin with. You can imagine uh, that's a, a pretty strong motivator for our upper management to make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen and um, keeps, keeps people really focused on making sure that the trees don't ever get there. The reason I'm kind of making a big point out of this is because I think when we're looking at multi-use of transition rights of way, we're looking holistically at the way we manage um, rights of way in general, it's really important that the environmental stewardship and ecological side of the house understands what's motivating the physical management side of the house as well, and vice versa, so that you know we can come to a common ground on, on how we can make sure that we can do the best by our constituents and by our environment, but also recognize that there is a pretty hefty regulatory obligation that we absolutely have to fulfill. So um, again, the, the very northern section of that blue line up there is where our hydro facilities are, just south of Ross, or part of Ross Lake there. 
they wind down the I-5 corridor into Metro Seattle, which is in that little red box section down at the bottom. And specifically where we're talking about the green line, the Crest and Duwamish line is a small portion of our line. And it's in that little black circle there that just appeared. That's what we're gonna be going deeper into today. So the other motivating, primary motivating factor, again, on the one hand, you've got the regulatory side and the energy delivery side, but again, as part of a department of the city of Seattle, Seattle City Light is really motivated and ultimately accountable to the values of the people of Seattle, the voters of Seattle, and to the elected officials here in the city of Seattle. And so we're looking at this whole challenge, not only from the uh, transmission side and the regulatory side, but also looking at how we can maintain our fiduciary responsibilities to the people of Seattle as far as reducing our maintenance costs and making sure that the tax dollars that are used to run the company are being used as wisely and effectively as possible. And also looking at the not only the values um, of the people of Seattle, which in case you're not aware, Seattle, relatively progressive city in the United States, um, very forward thinking environmental and stewardship values, but also looking at managing the land that we're responsible for in a way that benefits all people from a habitat and environmental perspective. The environmental leadership initiative Rory is going to go into more deeply, but that was started a couple of years ago and basically called out um, the need for a focused attention, kind of a pilot project to really see if we can find out the best way to marry all of those different uh, perspectives and really put them into practice. Uh, this slide here is probably the most important slide that I've got because I think it's really important, again, to draw that direct line between what does it mean to be the greenest utility? What does it mean to be public power? At City Light, the people, you think the greenest utility is the people of utility. So we've got these transmission corridors that are literally running through every neighborhood, type of neighborhood that you can imagine. And they're not really con particularly concerned with who lives there, what their socioeconomic background is, what the um, makeup of the community is. But still, that is a common thread that does run through all these different communities. So City Light as the power distributor, transmitter, generator has a role to play in fostering a sense of community and fostering a sense of um, the connection that are, that are derived by that transmission right away that physically moves from yard to yard, from, from neighborhood to neighborhood. It's also an opportunity to look at how we're promoting equity as a city. So how is the city focusing on where they're putting their dollars and where they're putting their investments and how are we evaluating which neighborhoods we're uh, supporting through investment and which neighborhoods maybe we're not doing as good a job of supporting. So looking, when we looked at where we were going to site um, this pilot project that came out of the environmental initiative, we really wanted to make sure that we were looking at a place that promoted equity and maybe rose, brought to the fore some neighborhoods that had not pr traditionally been served by the city as well as some others. And then the third bullet point there is Public power is all about affordability, safety for the public, and being a trusted partner in the distribution and the transmission of power to people. It's also taking a look at vegetation as an asset, so recognizing that we have a fairly significant impact on the environment in and around Metro Seattle because of the work that we do, because of the amount of land that's covered by these transmission rights of way. And so how do we act as a responsible steward to increase the ecosystem services that those plots of land can provide. And then from a fiduciary standpoint, again, um, studies have shown that if we use, if we can utilize vegetation to manage vegetation, we can see as much as a 30% reduction in maintenance costs over traditional methods like mowing and, you know, more um, labor intensive and resource intensive methods. So how can we do that to make sure that the return on investment for our ratepayers is maximized? How we do that, um, we didn't come up with all these ideas on our own. Luckily, there's a lot of really smart people who've done a lot of really good work over the years. Um, big picture, what we're looking at is when we when we look at the transition rights of way, we try to um, operate under what is a modified wire zone, border zone management approach. So a little bit of history, uh, 1953, Bramble and Burns out of uh, Penn State uh, started working on a, a section, a three mile plot of transition right of way. Uh, specifically because the community was asking for um, information and insight into how that 
that right away was managed relative to, I think it was predominantly game habitat. That was the concern at the time. So wanting to make sure that there wasn't a, a negative effect that the utility was having on that habitat. Uh, they started that study in 1953. It is ongoing today and is the longest running uh, contiguous study uh, in the country. And a lot of really good work has come out of that, specifically in 1982, so we're fast forwarding about 30 years, the concept of the wire zone border zone method comes into vogue. And basically, if you're looking down from a from a high noon perspective on the transmission line, it breaks up the managed right of way. So again, from, from one edge to the other edge into these three discrete sections, the wire zone would be kind of looking straight down on the towers directly in the shadow of the wires and the towers. And then on either side of that is what they're calling the border zone. The guidance there is that in the wire zone, that's where things are most important that you have a really, really close handle on the management. So low grasses, forbs, low growing plant communities are permissible there. And then as you move out uh, closer to the right of way edge, you can kind of taper up uh, your tolerances to have uh, smaller shrubs and smaller trees growing up until you get to the right of way edge. And that's considered the border zone. Um, fast forwarding again to about 2007, uh, NOAC et al. came together and said, well, this is, this is a fantastic um, guidance, but in reality, uh, the world exists in three dimensions. So can we dial this in a little tighter and look at the way that we're setting our vegetation tolerances in 3D? So rather than saying, thou shall not have any tree greater than 10 feet in the wire zone, well, if that tree is standing on a 30-foot hill, that makes a big difference. If it's sitting in a 60 foot valley, it also makes a big difference. You can probably get away with a lot more than that. So it's taking a look at that third dimension. It's also taking a look at where the wires are strung from tower to tower. You know, the closer you are to the tower, the higher up the wire is in space. As it moves across, you know, the wires kind of form a parabola. So you've got a low section, or what we call the belly of the line, right about in the center point between the towers. Obviously your tolerances are gonna be a little bit tighter there versus closer to the towers where um, the wires are physically higher and aren't going to sag as much. So just taking the wires on border zone thought and advancing it a little bit into a third dimension. And that's the way that City Light, as well as many others, really focus um, our management practices and try to make sure that we're, we're tailoring it to the environment, local environment, as closely as we can, make sure that we're promoting as much habitat as we can. The other large overarching um, guidance is uh, the Integrated Vegetation Management Best Management Practices uh, Guide, which is put out by the American National Standards Institute and the International Society of Arboriculture, which uh, is kind of a soup to nuts best management practices for transmission vegetation work and takes into account not only the wires on border zone, but also this concept of adaptive management where we don't have to do the same thing year after year after year just because that's the way granddad did it. We can take a look at site-specific um, work. We can tailor it to those plant communities and to the environment that we're operating in, uh, have an intervention, see how it goes, monitor it, and then make some changes going into the next cycle so we can constantly adapt to the plant communities that hopefully we're, we're changing and developing as time goes on. So hopefully that uh, brings everybody up to about the same speed as to uh, how transmission veg management kind of works at City Light. I'm going to hand it over to Rory now, who's going to go into the Environmental Leadership Initiative and some more depth from there. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, so uh, the Crescent Duwamish uh, transmission line that Dave mentioned, which is in uh, um, North Tukwila and South Seattle. Tukwila is a community just to the south of Seattle. Um, it's basically runs across a valley, the Duwamish Valley. That's if the map there on the screen is um, uh, the Duwamish River, Seattle's only river. Um, and this is, uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, site and it's got some unique characteristics. Um, it's a very industrialized area. Uh, it's also um, an area with uh, lower income populations. We we, this environmental leadership initiative was designed to basically be a pilot uh, project to see how we could make changes in the way we manage vegetation on our transmission lines 
and and see basically study them to see how we could do things better. Um, in as part of our this environmental leadership, we uh, designated three um, goals that we want to achieve for uh, the effort. First is maximize ecosystem services, maximize ecosystem resilience, and maximize community participation. Um, the uh, it was decided that um, we could write some plans that might sit on a shelf, and in fact, that has been tried in the past uh, at, here at City Light. We said we need to do things different if we are actually going to make a uh, difference in the long term. So that's where the community participation comes in, and I'll explain that a little bit more here as we go. Um, maximizing ecosystem services, um, hopefully everybody's familiar with that term, ecosystem services, but ecosystem services are all of the things that nature provides us for free. So the, the oxygen in the air, um, clean water, uh, pollination, um, clean air. Um, so all of these things that are provided by nature, they, uh, in terms of regulating nutrient cycles, such as the nitrogen or carbon, carbon sequestration is an ecosystem service. So we, the goal for our uh, looking at this environmental leadership initiative is to figure out, okay, how can we, how can we manage vegetation in a way that maximizes ecosystem services? Uh, maxim maximize ecosystem resilience. Um, the term resilience refers to the amount of disturbance that an ecosystem can take and still function and have this and similar structure to its original um, characteristics. However, change is inevitable. Uh, in the photo here, you can see a, a good example of this. This is a, a fir forest in um, the Pacific Northwest that is uh, being devoured by uh, beetles, and um, this is the result of climate change. As our, as our winters get warmer in the northwest, the beetles um, are better able to survive, and so they've gone crazy, and um, if you go, to, especially on the east side of the Cascade Mountains, you see this, this is common sight right now, and so resilience refers to, okay, that forest, um, how how much of that change can it take before it turns into something else? You know, maybe is it with climate change and increased beetle attacks, maybe this forest just loses so many trees that it um, fire just comes through and burns up all the wood, and maybe it turns into a sagebrush shrub step kind of ecosystem. So that's the idea of resilience. But if if there's enough diversity in that forest, maybe there are certain species, say ponderosa pine or Douglas fir, that can are not um, that are resistant to beetle attacks and also more drought resistant. And maybe that can remain as a forest and not convert to a different type of ecosystem. So biodiversity is important in terms of promoting uh, ecosystem resilience. And then maximizing community participation. These are some uh, principles that have been identified. Uh, Gruber et al. Had, uh, has done a good job in 2008 of describing what it really means to um, have community-led uh, natural resource management. And I think for us, it's really important, as Dave pointed out, that our principles at City Light our values uh, promote uh, community involvement, community participation, but also just from a practical standpoint, uh, City Light is a public utility. We're not, uh, we don't have limitless resources. We need public re uh, participation. We also need the public to tell us what they want and how the right of way can benefit them as well. So these are things that are just practical standpoints of. Uh, why having really solid community participation um, is important. And this is the, something that, uh, frankly, I think is the thing we really need to work on more. Um, this is something that, in not just uh, quantity of participation, but the diversity and quality of participation, I think is something that we really need to um, emphasize going forward. 
Um, back to the Crest and Duwamish uh, area. This is just some demographics to show you that uh, the three zip codes that that transmission line runs through are generally um, more diverse and lower income than the population uh, in Washington State as a whole. Um, and uh, so this is something that we we initially were looking at another transmission line uh, on the east side of uh, Lake Washington and um, the reason was we were getting frequent complaints there from the residents along that. However, we decided that the Creston Duwamish deserved our attention because it is um, more diverse and um, lower income. And I'm, I think that was a good, uh, a good move. I think that, that we, it was a, a sound call to uh, decide to shift our focus on a transmission line where people would uh, benefit greater from the work that we were doing not just on the amount of number of complaints that we get. Um, so in this environmental leadership initiative, I'll go through each one of these, but I just wanted to kind of list out, we're, we're still in the process of this uh, leadership initiative. We're still learning. Um, in fact, I'm hoping that uh, through your questions and comments, we can glean from you all on uh, your ideas. But so here are some of the things that we are, we've are we managed to accomplish since we started the Environmental Leadership Initiative. Um, we formed a committee of stakeholders, and that was both internal and external. It's important to get uh, your internal people on board to help get their input and their involvement and understand the various complexities from vegetation management to transmission engineering, we need to understand what are all of the concerns and criteria out there. And then of course the community understanding from people that live and work in the neighborhood that the transmission line goes through and understanding what's important to them and what they want to see and how they want to be involved. Um, one of the th first things we did was we basically mapped or inventoried the vegetation on the transmission line, the Crested Duwamish. We identified seven sites with the potential for habitat improvement. Um, and we also mapped the type of uh, vegetation, the, the dominant species of each vegetation patch, the structure and, and landscape type. So for example, uh, a, a vegetation patch that is dominated by Himalayan blackberry we, uh, the dominant species would be, of course, Himalayan blackberry. The structure would be uh, scrub shrub, and the landscape type uh, could either be um, uh, mesic or, or wet soil conditions. Um, so we, we mapped that, and that gave us a good baseline of information to really understand, okay, here's what we're dealing with. And we had some interesting findings from that um, inventory. The uh, we found that there were some uh, critical habitats that were adjacent to the right-of-way and the right-of-way actually had, um, it basically bisected some of these critical habitats. Um, some of them like the riparian area along the river, but also areas designated by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife as important urban habitat. Um, we identified some of the fast-growing tree species, including black cottonwood, big leaf maple, and uh, red alder. And we also found that uh, the vegetation on the right-of-way was dominated by weeds, uh, non-native invasive species. Um, you just, here's just a quick graph to, that shows that um, kind of the composition of the of the vegetation on the right of way. Um, essentially 25 of the acres of the on the right of way are dominated by invasive species, 10 of 10 invasive species, and um, about seven or so acres are dominated by native, and that was 10 species. So interesting kind of look at diversity there that 10 invasive species dominated way more of the vegetation than 10 of the native species. And then some areas that were either in um, a garden 
you know, adjacent neighbors had started to garden or something like that. And then a, an invasive native mix that wasn't easily classified. Um, we also found that the some of the, our practices on the right of way um, were also contributing to the level of invasive species cover on the right of way. This is a uh, breakdown by those seven sites that we identified as potential habitat restoration or habitat stewardship enhancement sites. Um, we those Banger, Ryan Hill, Ryan Creek, Duwamish Hill. Northwind, Roseburg, and Duwamish uh, substation were the uh, names that we gave the seven sites. Here's just a kind of breakdown of the characteristics and the relative abundance of the vegetation on the right of way. So, through this environmental leadership and doing this inventory, we uh, basically posed the question. How do we promote stable, diverse, low-growing native plant communities without the heavy use of herbicides? Um, Seattle is uh, has a, one of its uh, values is to reduce the amount of pesticides that we use, and so that for the city of Seattle, that's an important um, objective. And um, I think it makes sense too, just in terms of habitat and uh, as well as the potential issues that some of those herbicides can have on wildlife, including pollinators. Um, we did a literature search uh, as part of this environmental leadership initiative, and we looked at all of the literature that was out there. And uh, some, as Dave pointed out, um, Penn State has done some incredible research over the years on how to manage vegetation on transmission rights of way. Um, that really affected, um, were really enlightening for us. There hasn't really been that uh, research done in the Pacific Northwest, which um, has some differences in plant communities out here than one would find in the Midwest or Eastern United States. So it's, uh, there, there's kind of a need for additional research out here, I think, on, on looking at how this is done. One of the things that has, one of the tools that has typically been used in using vegetation for uh, vegetation management is that basically the idea has been to use um, spreading shrubs, uh, often um, in the blackberry or raspberry family, rubus genus, to uh, suppress and sort of create these stable um, shrub communities. They have generally focused on using one or two species of plants, however. And so we wanted to look at, well, uh, diversity is important for the resilience uh, of the ecosystem as well as providing uh, ecosystem services. So how is there a way to use those kind of same ideas but use a diverse plant community instead of a monoculture of uh, shrubs? Uh, we, through this literature search, we looked at um, what has been done traditionally and still continues to this day by Native Americans. Uh, Native Americans, a lot of people uh, think that they were hunter-gatherers but uh, and that they lived off of salmon here in the Puget Sound area. But uh, the reality is that they were horticulturalists. They were doing some amazing things with spreading different plant species, lighting fires. Back in the Midwest, I know uh, the use of fire as a tool for vegetation management by Native Americans was extensive as well. Um, but that's becoming a little bit more, uh, coming to the light a little bit more here in the Northwest. The problem is that um, as the Native Americans were forced onto reservations and then uh, put into Indian schools, a lot of that um, culture and traditional ecological knowledge has been lost. And so it's the challenge is picking up the pieces where we can, but and also trying to use those systems as references and, and, and build on them so that we can promote biodiversity. That was one of the things that I think that was important distinction between the way the Native Americans managed the um, 
their food systems here as opposed to our industrial food production systems is they really focused on biodiversity. Um, so as part of the leadership initiative, we also conducted a pilot study where we did set up plots on our right of way to look at um, using a couple of different tr treatments that were diverse and uh, plant species composition and also focused on pollinator friendly native plants. Um, so we did, we set up five blocks of five uh, treatments. One was no, con no treatment, which is a control, and then existing maintenance, and uh, then two treatments. One was uh, forbs and grasses only, and then forbs, grasses, plus shrubs, uh, and then one was just weed control only. And uh, we're two years of data collection so far. We're going to do another year of data collection. Um, but our initial results suggest that um, the pollinator habitat treatments provided more native cover as well as more diversity of species. We had less invasive plant cover, and um, they were just as good as existing maintenance, which for the Crest and Duwamish right of way has been uh, primarily mowing. Uh, we wrote a stewardship strategy that um, uh, basically uh, facilitates community participation uh, in management of the right of way, and it it's there is a focus on pollinator habitat, but it also allows a range of ecosystem services. So um, the communities, the neighborhoods that are adjacent to the transmission line, it's important that they provide us feedback. So if pollinators aren't the main thing that they're interested, in, maybe it's uh, an adjacent freeway and they want to buffer air pollution and noise from that freeway, and that's the main or the primary ecosystem service that they are interested in, this stewardship strategy uh, allows that flexibility. And um, the other thing does it that it does, as Dave mentioned, is it promotes adaptive management, so working with the community in their stewardship so that we can have a way, a system of monitoring the results and then feedback loops in uh, figuring out how to adjust our management to improve. Um, we also were fortunate enough to have some really great work by the Xerces Society in writing some criteria for us in terms of what makes good pollinator habitat. Um, they did an excellent job in providing some really good information that I think will be useful for our stewardship groups that are interested in focusing on, on pollinator habitat. We also, the city has done some great work in looking at how do we promote the um, equity and environmental justice in Seattle and everything that we do. And I think that's been a really good resource for us and then some great work on some of the health um, impacts from re um, reduced environmental quality uh, that the University of Washington and others have done. So this, this strategy basically takes all of this information into account, as well as uh, those fast-growing tree species. Here on the left, bottom left, we see black cottonwood, and then silver poplar, which is a non-native species that is also prevalent on the right of way and some of you may know they sucker up profusely and they also are extremely fast growing. So these were all included in that um, stewardship strategy. Uh, so now uh, what Washington State has a law that basically as a public utility Seattle City Light um, is allowed to provide stewardship permits on based on basically based on two conditions. One, the utility needs to receive a um, mutual offsetting benefit. So this would be typically um, the reduced maintenance of vegetation is required. So as groups want to do pollinator habitat or other habitat, um, it uh, provides a vehicle for that. The other condition is that there's that the public benefit and that there can't be private benefits, so public has to benefit. 
um, as part of those. So we're writing stewardship permits with a whole range of uh, stewardship groups. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Allison and, and Bob. Thank you, Rory. And uh, again, thanks to Iris and, and Antonio and to everybody who's um, tuned in today. This uh, webinar, as we've been hearing from Dave and Rory, is a story of transmission corridors and of restoration ecology. And as, as we've tried to emphasize, it's also a story of community. And by that, I'd like to emphasize communities of pollinators, which um, are very discreet sometimes, and then also of people. And at the Common Acre, we're trying to um, pose some questions about these communities. How do we get them to interact with each other? How do we build literacy, especially um, among the humans who live along the corridors? And then how do we get these people to care, grossly put? How do we get them to care and to participate? And for us, the answer involves science and art. And here to elaborate on some of that is Alison Renard, the executive director of The Common Acre. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so at the Common Acre, we are rewriting the conservation story. Sorry, I advanced a little too far here. Let's try and get back. Uh, we restore relationships between people and the earth through innovative programs rooted in ecology, community, and the arts. Here you can see some examples of our programming. In the upper left is a painting from our year-long art exhibit at SeaTac Airport which explored themes of pollinators and transportation in conjunction with our bee breeding and habitat installation project. We've also co-produced CHOMP, our county's local food and sustainable living festival for three years. You can see it here on the right with families experiencing the joy of chickens. We're also growing partnerships with other community groups. One is Njitua, an indigenous alliance which supports efforts to protect and heal the earth for all. And this June, we'll host a Pollinator Week Symposium. The symposium brings together scientists, artists, and community organizers. We'll answer the question, what can our communities do to conserve pollinators? For the past five years, our primary focus has been bees. We chose bees, thanks Allison. We chose bees because, um, as you probably know, they're endlessly fascinating, ecologically threatened, and hugely crucial to our food system. In Washington state alone, where we are, they're responsible for 2.2 billion of the $50 billion food and ag industry. And in the US, since World War II, the number of production colonies of honeybees have declined by 60%. This is in addition to the annual losses of up to 40%. And of course, crucially, many native species are imperiled as well. So bees are kind of indicator species for ecological health and community health. They propagate plants, they help wetlands, they attract songbirds that basically supports the whole food chain. And they have a huge cultural impact. Um, we're kind of, our culture's tuning into that for the first time in 150 years. But um, this, this awareness goes way back and um, in 4500 BC, for instance, the Egyptians got this, this interconnection when they floated bees up and down the Nile. They revered bees so much that they carved seeds like this one on the sides of pyramids. They buried pharaohs with honey. And uh, today people are starting to tune into the significance too. So through some of the innovative programs that Allison began to describe, our organization is trying to make the same kind of connections that are comprehensive and culturally meaningful. Um, we've been working for five years with the Port of Seattle. Um, we created the Flight Path Project. And in this slide, you can see on the left side what used to be a golf course, but we're um, restoring that to, to pollinator habitat. And we're also inventorying bees there. And we'll hear more about that later from Dr. Sugden. With um, Washington State University, we co-created the Northwest Pollinator Initiative. And uh, that's a citizen science project to monitor wild bees and also to support agriculture and make the links between community involvement and uh, regional agriculture. That initiative has also included some field days in addition to the website interface that you just saw. 
um, field days out in the fields um, <laughs> where we bring the science to the um, to the people. And uh, as Allison mentioned, our pollinator lecture for the past four years has kind of grown into what's going to be a pollinator symposium that we're producing this June in Seattle. So um, that brings us to um, kind of one of our other marquee projects, which is working with City Light on the Green Line, which is kind of our way of um, expressing this transmission corridor. Um, here you can see the corridor stretching uh, across Seattle with the Duwamish River, obviously prominent, and then I-5, the big highway, um, cutting through the slide as well. Um, we're studying how to connect the habitat and actually starting to do that, but um, not just for electricity, but for a diversity and abundance of bees plants and humans. So that's really important. Bees, plants, and humans are the things that we're trying to connect. Um, for the first three years, we've done um, pollinator inventory studies, um, uh, specifically before, after control inventory, where we um, saw what kind of bees are there in the community. Uh, we'll be planting, we're planting habitats, and then we're going to measure again and see what the impact is on the bees. Um, Evan Sugden will, will really get into some fascinating data on that. And then, Secondly, we've begun to restore the plant communities and uh, finally develop the human community as well. And um, Allison, back to you. So to get started, uh, we chose this site along the Bangor substation in South Seattle in the upper Rainier Beach neighborhood as our pilot habitat installation. This site was chosen for its high visibility on a busy street. It has an existing walking path, so there's a lot of potential for public engagement. We spent about three years planning, designing, and pursuing permitting. You can see here a volunteer working on the pollinator survey during this time. And we partnered with a local urban agriculture organization called Alley Cat Acres. They designed a native plant palette maximizing pollinator and human forage. The design met right-of-way clearance requirements for Seattle City Light and other utilities. It also adapted to varied hydrology and invasive species cover on the site. And we used edible and medicinal native plants to feed and educate people. At the Common Acre, we strive to make our work as communitarian as possible. Our inclusive outreach strategy is ongoing. We began in 2015 by hosting public site visits going door to door in the immediate neighborhood, installing signage, and hosting community meetings to gather feedback on our program. By using people-powered, non-herbicide invasive species treatments, we have involved hundreds of volunteers in more than a dozen work parties over two years. In the fall of 2017, we installed 300 native shrubs and forbs with 40 volunteers of all ages and abilities. Ongoing maintenance and watering will be performed by AmeriCorps teams from Earth Corps and by community volunteers, but our work is just beginning. Back to you, Bob. As, um, as you probably gleaned from everything that's been said from Dave and Roy, there's been years and thousands of hours of work that's been dedicated to this project. and. Um, a small, tiny part of the entire transmission corridor, but it's starting to get very, very interesting. And because these different channels are intersecting, um, they're they're firing and sparking. I want to use that metaphor specifically. Um, the bees, the pollinators, the um, other fauna, the plants, and the people are all starting to interact together. And uh, I want to propose that this is this is a different kind of power that the transmission corridor is um, conducting. And it's when all these, communi these communities interact together. So um, collectively, we know a lot about um, bees and restoring bees. We know a lot about restoring plants. And uh, we even know how to get people to show up for a work party. But as I suggested at the beginning, we're, we're after more than that. We're after a cultural shift. And uh, we want to get the entire community to care and to participate. And um, so the question is, how do we cultivate that vision? How do we tell a story that captivates um, people in our community and really gets them to, to engage? And uh, so there's another level to this, and Allison's going to describe that. 
So this year, a crucial component of our work will be the launch of our Art Starts residency. Art Starts will generate cross-pollination between local artists, scientists, and community members. We want to challenge them to create artistic expressions of work happening on the Green Line. Diverse, multidisciplinary artists from within the immediate neighborhood will create a temporary art and performance showcase on the right-of-way at our grand opening ceremony in September. From the very beginning, we're engaging local residents in program design by building a stakeholder committee and review panel to guide the artistic prompts and lead the conversation on land use. To inform their creative work, artists will participate in neighborhood outreach, community events, planting, and even habitat maintenance. Our outreach strategy takes a neighborhood-centric approach by partnering with community groups within the Rainier Beach neighborhood. One key partner is the Rainier Beach Action Coalition. Here's one of their key strategists, David Sovian, sharing a brilliant idea with me and Common Acre Board President Nat Mangus at the planting party this fall. The coalition's work focuses on building a beautiful and safe place for all, lifelong learning, and growing food to develop healthy industry. Rainier Beach Action Coalition is an essential part of the Green Line's success in reaching the community. Long term will depend on many partners as the project grows. Here are just a few. So it's a big lift by a lot of people. Um, the audacious goal is that we're trying to change culture. It's pretty, um, pretty. we're shooting high with that. Um, and we're interested to see how, you know, this little acre that we've done so far can expand along this line and, and beyond. At heart, you know, besides being really quixotic, we are, uh, we love science and we're really science-based and that is going to help um, justify a lot of the things that we're working on. So um, here to talk about the, the science of the bees particularly is Dr. Evan Sugden uh, of the University of Washington and also lead researcher and entomologist for this project. Well, thank you to the organizers and my fellow presenters and also our esteemed audience. I'm here to talk about the, the science of the bees themselves. And as, as Bob uh, very uh, elegantly outlined, bees are a representative of pollinators in general. And the ability to assess bees is pretty well developed. So we are using bees as sort of the, the focus for this study and the paradigm for pollinators in general. Uh, I work with the uh, University of Washington in two departments, the Biology Department and also the School of Environment and Forestry Sciences. The goals of our pollinator work are pretty simple um, as the science project goes. We're assessing the diversity of bees at the targeted areas along the Green Line corridor, selected areas. Uh, we're also recording bee food plants as they relate to the bees themselves. And uh, the idea there is to watch as the vegetation changes, how it relates to changes in the bee community. And we're hoping that ultimately the data we're accumulating may contribute to a regional bee faunal list, which has never been made for the Seattle area. Uh, the methods that we use have been pretty well standardized across the country. So the value of this is that we can compare our data to the data from other studies in other parts of the country to make more sense of it. And they consist primarily of trapping bees, which is the only convenient way to, to get enough bees to give us a picture of what's there. And the traps we use are small plastic bowls of three different colors, which attract the bees by fooling the bees into thinking they're flowers, basically. And also a type of trap that's come to be called the blue vein trap, which is a larger uh, half gallon plastic tub, basically, with a series of blue veins which intercept flying insects and cause them to fall inside. So the bees are sacrificed in uh, detergent water inside these either bowls or blue vein traps. And uh, we do collect those bees in some quantity, but not nearly enough, we think, to affect the population of bees there. So it's what scientists sometimes call destructive sampling. But when you talk about insects, you can afford to take a few without affecting the population significantly. And we're supplementing our traps with collecting with a traditional insect net, both by hand, one at a time, 
and also sweeping, which is a method of dragging the net across the vegetation to get large numbers of bees at one time. Our, our field sites are distributed along the green line. Basically, we're, we're piggybacking on top of the restoration work that's already been done. And we have set up at the green line five different sites over a transect of about four miles long. So that spans pretty much the full length of the Green Line corridor. Um, not ecologically defined, but more metaphorically defined, we have four habitat types, upland meadow, in which there are two sites, bog meadow, lowland meadow, and riparian meadow. So this is a way of sort of looking at the sites in terms of what types of bees we expect to find there. We basically visit each site for a day, for 24 hours. That's how long our traps are set. And we do this every month throughout the warmer part of the year, generally March through September. Processing and identifying what we catch in our traps is a very large part of what we do, and it takes a significant amount of time back in the lab, so to speak. And we've involved um, a dozen or so people in the process through the years that we've been working on the survey. The processing consists of taking the bees out of the traps, putting them into alcohol temporarily with an appropriate label, and bringing them back to the lab, having a look at them closely and taking out the bees that we can easily identify to the species level, and there are actually quite a few of those. So we, we count those, enter them into our data system, and then put them in, in glass vials. The rest of the bees, they're a little harder to identify, or they're more interesting for various reasons, are processed by drying them from the alcohol until they're, until they're fluffy on the outside and look natural, and then pinning them and making regular museum specimens, which enables us to look at the details of them and actually identify them to species. So this is done, and this also takes quite a lot of time. And in order to identify some of those bees, we have to have enlist the help of specialists elsewhere. So we spent quite a bit of time at museums uh, in different parts of the West, getting professional help on telling us exactly what species we have. But at the same time, learning those skills ourselves. So we're amassing a, our own skill set to use. So as we go along, we become more efficient in identifying our bees. So up in the upper right, here's how the bees look as specimens. They have quite a bit of information pinned to them, which uh, makes them valuable to science years into the future. And each one receives its own unique number, which is a very important feature because it allows us to go back at a later time into the database and, and change the data respective to individual specimens. Uh, ultimately, they're filed into drawers, as you see in the lower left here, which is a typical museum drawer with insect specimens, and they're filed by species. So we have a very organized collection of the bee biodiversity as it occurs in the green line. And some of the details of identification are shown in the lower right there, which I won't go into at the moment. The results of our finds for the three years we've been assessing the bees uh, are interesting. Shown here are a couple of species we have commonly at our, at our research sites, a bumblebee and a, and a green sweat bee. The most important finding is that we have amassed at least 74 recognizable species of bees along the Green Line corridor sites. Now, I say at least because in all likelihood that number will expand as we become better at recognizing and distinguishing our species. We identify them to the best of our abilities initially, and then as we accumulate more skills, we go back and we can actually find more species amongst the specimens we've already preserved. This, those 74 species represent all five families of bees that we would expect to find in our area, which is um, interesting and also kind of comforting. We have really good biodiversity there. And about five of those species are, are heavily dominant and make up about half of the bees that we actually collect. That's normal for most habitats, especially habitats that are fairly disturbed. Uh, we also find parasitic species of bees, which is normal for bee communities uh, about, at about the 10% level. So 10% of those species are actually bees that steal pollen from other bees instead of collecting it themselves. And that's normal, they're part of the community. Uh, we also have a, quite an assortment of large bees, which are the bees most people would most often observe, especially bumblebees, but also including some leafcutter bees and some mason bees, which gardeners have become familiar in recent years. 
Honeybees are present because there are hives nearby most of the sites where we're doing our research, but we don't commonly collect them in the traps because like some other bees, they're just not as attracted to traps. And so this illustrates the bias in our system, which is present in all systems of collecting data and especially trapping animals, which is why we use more than one type of trap and why we supplement our traps with net collecting. And we also found, not surprisingly, and as, as indicated by Rory as well, that the bees' plants, their host plants, are dominated by non-natives. Some of the results can be shown graphically in pie charts, which are fairly easy to understand. So here we have uh, two collections of data. First of all, species by family. So this is our five families of bees that are present and how they relate to each other in, in terms of the number of species. Uh, some are considerably more dominant than others. So you get the, uh, the purple pie slice on the left, 37% are the, uh, the aphids, or the, the bumblebees and their relatives, the honeybees, small carpenter bees and others. I won't go into detail on the others, but it's, that's sort of a representative snapshot of the types of bees we have in our community. The actual numbers of individuals per species are shown on the right with our five dominant species being those that occur to the right of the center line, the vertical center line of that pie. So as you can see, over half of them are, are these five dominant species, and the rest are the number of species by family. So these are just different ways of looking at how the diversity is spread over different types of bees. Uh, the significance of our work is um, primarily that we have a really good picture now of the diversity of bees as representative of pollinators in general on the green line. And we are set to have a look perhaps in the future at how the restoration efforts there are affecting the bee communities. So our bee diversity is quite impressive uh, and it is a good background. And uh, we're hoping that uh, we can at some point continue this work and have a look at the before and the after part. And I'll conclude with that, um, and this picture of a bee that is a possible new species in the Seattle area, it's, it's one that we're not sure we have at our site yet, but that we're watching. So there, there are other scientific stories sort of tucked into the work we're doing here, which is typical of scientists. We all like to do moonlight work and try to get a little extra information out of our studies. So that's the story of the bees, and I'll conclude my portion of the webinar. Okay, so that uh, basically brings us to uh, what's next, the next steps. Um, having trouble uh, advancing the slides here. There you go. Okay, yeah, so Nick, what's next? Uh, as I pointed out earlier, we're we're learning here. And, um, you know, we've got a pretty good start, but uh, there's some things that we still need to do. A um, couple of those are we need to build some reference models for what it is we're trying to accomplish with the habitats. Um, there are some prairie, remnant prairies that are just southeast of Seattle, um, one in particular, Jenkins Prairie, that we're looking at as a potential reference model. We also need to refine our best management practices for both uh, uh, volunteers and staff, and we need to provide training on those best management practices. Uh, I think there is some work to be done in identifying the needs of the stewardship groups that are working on the transmission line. And then as um, Evan pointed out, we need to follow up with the after portion after we do the restoration. So we can identify what actually we've accomplished in terms of pollinator diversity and, and numbers. Um, we need to um, build out our adaptive management system so that we can identify what, what works and what doesn't, how we can improve. And we need to work on eliminating silos both within the community and uh, collaborating with the community and collaborating internally within City Light. We've made a good start. Um, we're really lucky to have um, 
a vegetation management unit that is forward uh, looking and, and wants to improve and that's been a huge benefit. Um, and then finally, we need to look at climate change. It's already having the impacts. We need to look at, okay, what are the additional impacts that we can expect in the Pacific Northwest? Uh, our winters are predicted to be wetter and warmer, um, and our summers are predicted to be uh, drier and hotter uh, based on the models that have been developed. So how does that impact the vegetation on the transmission lines? It's If we do nothing, uh, my suspicion is we would see increased invasive species. Right now, there, there's the, the native seed bank isn't there anymore in, in these highly disturbed environments. So we need to work on getting natives back in and, and maybe also with assisted migration, looking at species that might be found in the Willamette Valley of Oregon or even Northern California. And we also, as I mentioned earlier, we, we need to constantly improve um, our environmental equity and community participation in making sure that we are serving the communities that live uh, in and around our transmission rights of way. So with that, I think we can open it up to questions or comments from people. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you all for, um, for that presentation. We've had a couple of questions come in, so we will um, prepare those. Um, but just want to say a couple things here before we um, pull the questions up. Uh, we had a question about um, accessing the presentation after um, today's uh, webinar. So we have recorded this webinar and we will make um, it available uh, on the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group website. Uh, we'll also send out a link to all of you um, with that, um, the, the webinar recording link when it's available. So um, again, Stay tuned for that. Um, but now, oh, I, I also wanted to mention, Iris, that um, that handout, the principles of ecological vegetation management um, for rights of way, uh, was basically developed uh, based on the literature search that we did, as well as some some of our own work here at City Light. And so we're offering that to others to stimulate um, discussion and. And if anybody has any questions on those, I'd be glad to answer that now, or you, we'll, maybe we can provide our emails and you can email us as well. Sounds good. Yeah, and just a uh, reminder that you can access that handout um, from the GoToWebinar dashboard. Um, if you're having trouble finding it, um, feel free to email me um, and I can send it to you. So uh, the first question is, a few slides seem to indicate that pollinator habitat is being restored along distribution lines as well as transmission lines. Would you please clarify if the green line is only working along transmission right-of-ways or also along distribution lines? Yeah, this is Dave Baird. Um, that's kind of incidental. So the transmission lines are, are there. There are places where we have um, what's called distribution underbuild. So it's either distribution lines that are on the same poles or just happen to be there because there are neighborhoods there. Again, we're, these transmission lines move through communities. So while they're kind of the, the highway to bring the power into the larger community, you're still going to have the local neighborhoods there that, that are using that lower um, voltage distribution system to get the power to their houses. So uh, the, I guess the answer is not, not intentionally, um, but there happen to be both systems in the same spot. And I would add to that, this project is is meant to be sort of a pilot project so that we can learn from it and, um, you know, down the road as uh, other portions of our transmission system or maybe even the distribution system, um, uh, if there was interest and it looked like it made sense, we could focus our attention on those as well. Cool. Thank you. Second question is can you discuss how you control the exotic grasses to convert to the native plant community without using herbicides 
Uh, that's extremely difficult. <laughs> Our agronomic grasses are um, things like perennial ryegrass, bent grass. Um, uh, so there, those sorts of grasses that are pervasive throughout, you know, the whole northern hemisphere now. Um, they're all mostly of Eurasian origin. Um, to, uh, historically, we would have had um, our grasslands would have been dominated by bunch grasses, and so converting from these rhizomatous agronomic grasses to bunch grass is tricky. What we did in the in the plots is we used a combination. So basically, we went in and we solarized, uh, and um, we so we basically laid clear plastic down over uh, the plots, uh, left it there over the course of a summer. It's a pretty hot summer, so it was worked pretty well. I think we could have done better, and we didn't get the edges completely buried as we should have. And what we ended up doing was going in and spot spraying uh, to take control of any of the grasses and other weeds that made it past the solarization. And then um, we also went through and we tried to sterilize the seed bank within the um, plots to by using uh, a propane torch. Uh, next question. How was, how has slash will the maintenance re uh, regim regime change now? Are you still mowing, cultivating, or creating other uh, disturbance to promote the native plant community? Well, I'll, I'll lead on that and then Dave can chime in too. Yeah, we, we're still going to need, this isn't going to get rid of our need for vegetation management. We'll still need that. But we will need to coordinate with, um, you know, between the stewardship groups and our vegetation management unit. So, for example, in some areas where we want to promote a, a grassland, forb-dominated uh, plant community, then we want to make sure that that area is mapped out and our vegetation management unit knows that that area gets mapped. We do need to also change the timing of our uh, mowing and other vegetation management activities. For forbs, you have to make sure that they've done, they're done flowering, that resource is available to the pollinator, and then they've actually gone to seed. Um, if you mow before they go to seed, you can interrupt that system and you basically go back to these agronomic grasses again. So uh, the timing uh, and the quantity of the management needs to be considered and as well as where and coordinated with between the community groups and the and the vegetation management unit. Dave, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just to say I think you know we, we're on year coming on year three of, of a pilot project so there hasn't been there's, there's nothing that's been widespread implemented as far as you know substantive changes in management practices well we're still trying to figure out what the what the answer is um, but I think Rory's point is a good one we're not I don't think anybody has an illusion that we're going to um, create a self-sustaining non-native all I mean sorry non-invasive you know all native habitat on a strip of land that runs through a whole bunch of other stuff that we're not dealing with uh, because we can't because it's private property and that it's it's going to somehow sustain itself and we won't have to manage it anymore. I think the goal is to uh, figure out what the best science is and the best uh, kind of tools in the toolbox are, kind of use a, a belabored metaphor, and um, and then try to implement that into our into our practices. So look at spaces where it is practical to do changes to the way our management regime is um, to still get the same results that we need uh, with lower resource um, input. The other part of, you know, just an, another kind of anecdotal story to, to complicate this whole thing is, is Roy was pointing out the mowing timing is a significant issue. Um, so for folks who are looking at at these things from the, from his perspective and from from this group's perspective, you know that's something that people are really keyed into. On the other hand, you've got folks who um, every year around the first uh, of July start 
absolutely freaking out and calling us and, and demanding that we mow everything to the nub because they're worried about fireworks on the 4th uh, burning down their neighborhood, which has never happened, but it doesn't stop them from calling the mayor and demanding that we do that. So we have to respond to that as well as responding to, to all these other um, you know, scientifically informed ideals. And that just makes it challenging and, and gives us, uh, again, opportunities to educate, opportunities to try to get in touch with the community and figure out what makes them tick so we can better understand that and then uh, have those conversations with them and, and try to find the happy medium. Uh, next question. Can Mr. Baird comment on some of the some run utility organization and larger private and a larger private one in terms of how a group might be able to create partnerships? I'm sorry, could you say that again? Uh, could you comment on some differences in a local government run utility organization and a larger private one in terms of how a group might be able to create partnerships? Uh, so I'll lead off by saying I don't have any experience working for private uh, power companies, so I don't want to get too far uh, down that road. But I think you know it really it really comes to for me, it comes down to what the what the intention is and what the driving motivating factors are for the vegetation management group and for the management structure at the utility. Um, if you know, if if you're viewing yourself as a public servant, um, as a public utility, as a department of the city, then then it, it opens up a pretty natural space for a whole host of conversations around what that means. Um, relative to ecosystem services, relative to habitat, relative to um, traditionally underserved communities and your obligation to them, and kind of takes away some of that uh, shareholder um, part of the conversation because the shareholders are the community as opposed to uh, folks who aren't necessarily. So I think the public power model is a good one because it naturally lends itself to opening the doors to some of those conversations. Otherwise, you're kind of um, relying on a profit-driven organization to make a decision um, that may not may not directly or very clearly affect um, the profits. Part of that again is also you know we're talking about education. So when you're you know looking at like that that bullet point that was on one of the slides about a 30% reduction cost, obviously you're not going to get that everywhere. Um, there are certain spots where you'll get major reductions and, and other spots where you won't. There are certain spots where you will be able to afford um, from a leg regulatory standpoint to make some of these changes and other spots you won't. And then logistics is a big part of it too. We're talking about some a plot of land that is right in and around Metro Seattle. But if you're talking about a stretch of your transmission line that's you know, 300 miles from, from any people, out in the woods, it's just difficult to get out there and, and practical to try to do this kind of um, intensive manipulation of the of the plant communities. So, I think I think that the challenges are just there are just a few more of them uh, on a non-public uh, power company, and a lot of it, you know, in order to make the change there, it's it's about education, it's about communication and conversations, and trying to make folks. Um, in the utilities sphere understand and appreciate the impacts uh, that these transition corridors can have and that the impacts that, um, you know, science-based, forward-thinking, community-based uh, management changes can have on those, on those transition lines and can have on the bottom line in the long run. Next question. Have you already experienced or do you anticipate this model will create any pushback from the community in rights of way where FAC 003 does not apply? Um, so you're, I guess I'm assuming they're sort of talking about um, that, that it might set an expectation in places, in other types of right of way where we don't have the same regulatory drivers does that sound about right yeah I think so yeah specifically 200 kV or less I think was the, the uh, questioners context yes yeah, so um, we're like you know right now we're just investing or implementing this pilot in on that NERC system uh, NERC compliance system the principles are the same um, on the lower 
lower voltage levels. And I think, no, so the short answer is no, we have not gotten any pushback from anybody um, either on the on the NERC compliance system or on the uh, 115 system. Um, the, the principles are the same. You could do it either place, um, but I think when we were looking at where we wanted to focus, uh, part of it was, you know, a, a big part of it was the community uh, that we wanted to actively engage in. And another big part of it is, is just when it comes down to it, we spend a lot more money um, on maintaining our NERC compliance system because the stakes are so much higher than we do on the 115 system. And it's, it's the overwhelming majority of our system. So a lot of other utilities, um, you know, a lot of utilities don't have uh, NERC compliance systems. Our, our neighbors to the south, Tacoma Light and Power, I think has like a mile stretch of uh, NERC compliant and the rest is operates at a 69 kV, so it doesn't even, it doesn't get into that. That doesn't mean that they couldn't choose to make uh, the same kind of, um, same kind of decisions and try to impact their transmission corridors. But it also means that, you know, the, the actual transmission corridor that you're operating on is a lot tighter because your tolerances are a lot higher. So because you don't have the federal government telling you that you have to do certain things, um, you can afford, and because the, the voltages aren't as high, you can afford to have narrower um, transmission rights of way. So it has a significantly less impact. You don't have as much space that you're talking about from the get-go. If you look at an overhead of our 200 kV system, our standard right of way is about 75 feet wide uh, for a single tower line. Some of them we have three towers next to each other, so they're a lot, a lot wider. But the uh, 115 ones are, are closer to 40 feet wide. Just because we don't need as much space, the construction of the poles are different. They're not the big towers. They're, you, they tend to be single poles. And um, we just have a lot less that we have to worry about. Are there any trees planted in the sites? If so, what species? Uh, as part of the stewardship effort, no. We, we created a plant list. Um, vetted it with our vegetation management unit and um, all natives, and uh, it does not include any tree species. Uh, Allison mentioned hydrology in reference to the Bangor site. Were you able to incorporate stormwater runoff from the road into the planting plant? In that particular site, uh, along the street, there's a pretty significant um, dredged drainage ditch, let's call it, that um, may also be considered Palestrine wetland, but we're uh, leaning towards drainage ditch. And so, and that part of the site, we have extremely wet conditions where we're planting more wetland species, uh, but we're not capturing or channeling stormwater. That that site originally was the headwaters to Ryan Creek and was probably a sort of an extensive wetland complex, but it's now considered part of the drainage infrastructure for Seattle Public Utilities. As to the bees, what will the uh what will collect what Will that collection be available to the public, like at the Burke Museum? Uh, the bee collection that we're amassing will be made public uh, and could be made public as soon as we get our data entered. But we're retaining some of the bees just for the purpose of our own learning on how to identify them. But ultimately, it will become part of a larger museum. Probably not the Burke because the Burke doesn't have a substantial entomology collection. Um, our first consideration is thanking our professional cooperators by donating the bees to their museum, and, and the most of those would be at the uh, USDA Bee Museum at Logan, uh, Utah State University at Logan, Utah. Um, so they'll probably go to the Bee Museum. Um, if things go differently in the future, uh, some of it or part of it might go to Washington State University, Oregon State University, but the short answer is yes, it will be made public. The final question is, uh, is an interim report available from the two-year pilot study that evaluated mixed prairie scrub slash shrub pollinator habitat? If so, where, where can we access that? 
uh, we're we're putting the final ta touches on the analysis of that. So if people wanted to email me, uh, once we get it ready, I would be glad to send it to you. Okay, excellent. Um, well, I want to um, thank, uh, first off, our speakers again for taking the time today uh, to share this project and this story and their lessons and experiences. I um, also want to thank our attendees. Um, again, as I said before, a recording of this webinar will be made available um, on our website. So we'll send out that link um, following uh, today's webinar. Also, there is a short survey um, that should pop up when you close out of GoToWebinar today um, that will also be linked from our follow-up email. Um, so if you can provide feedback on that survey, we'd very much appreciate that. Um, and so with that, we will end today's webinar. And thank you again.